Welcome to this webinar on exporting obesity, the links between trade, diet, and health. My name is Karen Hansen Kuhn, and I'm with the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. IETP works locally and globally at the intersection of policy and practice to ensure fair and sustainable food, farm, and trade systems. The speakers, and I think also the audience today, are at the intersection of the public health and food security community. In the U.S., there's an ongoing debate in the public health community about rising obesity rates and what we need to do with our food system to address that problem. Internationally, uh, food security has traditionally focused on issues of insufficient food, but more and more we're seeing rising obesity rates in many emerging economies and countries of the South as well. Uh, so this is also becoming an issue at the global level. Today, we're honored to have Professor Olivier de Schuter, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. The right to food has three key elements, access to sufficient food, availability of food, which is both physical or economic, and adequacy of food, which is what we'll focus on primarily today. Uh, Professor de Schuter conducts missions to many countries to assess the implementation of the right to food and issues reports on various aspects. Uh, on the right to food. Most recently, last month, he, he delivered a report to the UN Human Rights Council on issues of nutrition, obesity, and the right to food. Globalization has linked our economies and societies in many ways, many of them unanticipated. ITP's Dr. David Wallinga, the director of our Food and Health Program, will discuss a new report by ITP on exporting obesity, essentially what happened in Mexico after the implementation of NAFTA and how the trade and investment rules contributed to a changing food environment in Mexico that coincided with a significant rise in obesity rates. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a couple of technical issues. We will be recording the webinar and we can send you a link uh, in a couple of weeks with the recording and the PowerPoint slides. Also, we'll be taking questions from the audience today after the two presentations. So you can submit your questions at any time during the webinar just by using the panel on your screen. Just type in your question and hit send. Um, any technical questions will be answered by Eleanor Westerly. Otherwise, we'll review the substantive questions as they come in, and the panelists will respond to them as much as they can. So let's start with a presentation by Olivier de Schuter. Okay, so good afternoon to all. Um, I am very delighted to take part in this webinar that was convened by the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. I am speaking from Brussels, uh, which, are, which is where I operate from, uh, but of course my main work is conducted in Geneva and, and New York with the United Nations. And Karen has already referred to the, um, to the report that I presented uh, um, to the Human Rights Council um, a couple of months ago, actually uh, one month ago, on the issue of um, uh, agriculture, uh, food, and, and health, and the links between the, the three. And in order to introduce our discussion today, I would like to say a few words about uh, what I found based on my consultations, based on, on the uh, work I did on this issue with the World Health Organization in particular, and the reports I was able to, to use and the experts I could, I could consult with. Um, let me perhaps begin by uh, recalling uh, what globalization is and what uh, we, we mean by this in the area of, of uh, the food systems. Globalization means um, first and foremost the expansion of trade in agricultural products. Um, to give just one illustration of the growth that was particularly spectacular between the 1980s and 1990s, um, the value of global trade in agricultural commodities increased um, almost doubling uh, from 222, 24 billion US dollars in 1972 to 438 billion US dollars in 1998. And the expansion since has been um, a, of a similar um, um, scope uh, and so we are seeing uh, a larger 
uh, volume and, and value of agricultural products traded overall. Um, today, um, uh, trade in agricultural products represents between 12 and, and 15 percent of the global um, uh, value of trade and it's uh, uh, higher than, than fuel. And although um, a relatively small percentage of the uh, agricultural products uh, are actually crossing borders, 15% uh, on average, um, we do have a very significant impact of um, that trade in agricultural products on the domestic um, uh, policies that concern agriculture, by which I mean that um, the impact of trade on agriculture goes far beyond those figures that represent the volumes of uh, products traded. They influence where investments go, they influence how people produce, they influence um, um, the, the, the type of commodities produced and the prices that are paid to farmers and that consumers um, um, uh, pay to have access to food. Uh, trade is not the only channel by which globalization makes progress. Of course, um, investment in uh, agriculture is also one part of globalization and over the past few years, particularly since 2005-2006, we've seen a significant increase in the investment going into this sector, uh, which for many years was neglected, particularly in, in developing countries, but is now very rapidly um, gaining uh, pace and, and uh, attracting the interest of investors. We see in many countries now in the developing regions food processing plants uh, being um, set up. We see supermarket chains uh, developing in, in Russia, China, India, Vietnam, and most recently in Southern and Eastern Africa in particular. And finally, globalization also means the diffusion of a cultural model, especially by uh, marketing of uh, foods, uh, especially towards children. And most of this uh, advertising of foods um, is actually advertising uh, foods that are very um, heavy in saturated fats in, in salt and sugar um, and it is particularly the populations uh, that are emerging from, from poverty that are targeted in developing countries today. So that is globalization and, and the um, uh, links to um, uh, the links to uh, the health dimensions uh, go through a number of channels and I I would like to focus particularly on points two and three of the screen here, but to be relatively um, comprehensive and balanced, I would like to, to mention the four ways in which this globalization of the food system um, influences um, uh, not just the food that is sold and consumed, but also the, the health of the population's concern. First of all, globalization is often seen as having some um, benefits uh, for populations in that, uh, of course, it increases the variety of food products that are available year-round, uh, notwithstanding the, the seasons. And for many consumers, uh, globalization has meant that food was uh, affordable, um, um, more affordable than in the past. Uh, food was uh, um, available at cheaper prices. Um, and this is the reason why many countries in the developing world have actually lowered their import tariffs and uh, developed a huge dependency on international markets to feed themselves. It was simply for them the cheapest way to provide affordable food to their populations. But there are also less positive impacts to this globalization of food systems and that relate more directly to the, to the nutrition aspects which my most recent report to the Human Rights Council uh, tries to document. Um, first, we have in developing countries uh, gradually a shift in the relative prices of foods uh, that is occurring, by which I mean that um, some high quality foods, fruits, vegetables in particular, increasingly are exported to the high value markets of the OECD countries and as a result their prices on the local markets increase, uh, putting them out of reach uh, for the poorest segments of the population which in those countries is therefore um, um, relegated to um, less nutritious diets, uh, mostly dependent on, on stocky staples and um, that are relatively micronutrient poor. Um, and this may be 
entirely compatible with the fact that uh, thanks to imports of large quantities of uh, wheat, uh, uh, corn or, or, or rice, for example, or soybean, these populations have access to a larger um, um, amount of calories, um, but it, nevertheless the, the diets for the poorest segments of the population um, uh, certainly um, are not necessarily as nutritious as they, as they could be otherwise. Um, a third link between globalization and the way food systems have evolved with the attendant public health impacts is that uh, more and more people come to rely on processed foods which uh, are developed by the food industry to have a long shelf life um, and this is what nutritionists call nutrition transition that is particularly um, visible in emerging economies uh, such as uh, Brazil, uh, China, India, uh, Mexico, all countries where I did conduct missions uh, looking at this, uh, at this issue in, in some detail and this nutrition transition means that populations shift diets adopting Western ways of feeding themselves and, and consuming foods that are richer in saturated fats, uh, sugars and salts, uh, particularly by uh, consuming larger quantities of snacks, soft drinks and, and processed foods more generally. And then finally, but this is an aspect which I won't spend much time on, um, globalization also means that producers um, in different countries, in different regions in the world are increasingly led to compete with one another um, as they have as clients the same buyers that um, uh, place them in competition with one another and this leads them to adopt modes of production that may have in, in many cases um, a problematic public health impacts. So these health impacts, uh, the result of these transitions um, are well known, I don't feel it is useful to spend much time on them, but of course um, foods that are um, energy rich uh, but relatively uh, nutrient poor, uh, foods that are um, intense in, in, in saturated fats and, and have important amounts of salts and, and sugars uh, lead to a number of non-communicable diseases which are now increasingly a concern for the UN system, for the World Health Organization in particular and that led the UN to convene this high level meeting of the General Assembly of the UN on the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases uh, in New York on 19th and 20th of September of last year, uh, where governments at the highest level uh, committed to a number of um, um, a number of objectives to reduce um, the the impacts of um, um, particularly shifting diets on um, cardiovascular diseases, uh, type 2 diabetes, or gastrointestinal. Uh, cancers, uh, which are the most um, well known, of course, of these health impacts of these shifting diets. Um, what I would like to emphasize, perhaps also as, as part of my report, is that um, the impacts of globalization of the food systems um, are different depending on the level of development of the countries and they affect different groups of the population within each country. Um, and, and to very roughly present uh, my findings here, I, I would say that in developed countries, in, in, in richer countries, um, it is primarily the poorest uh, segment of the population that is affected by these um, changing diets um, as essentially uh, the poor can afford more easily unhealthy diets that are um, uh, mainly uh, consisting in um, foods high in, in fats, in, in salt and sugar, heavily processed foods, whilst in contrast um, uh, fruits and vegetables and more plant-based diets are less uh, uh, affordable to them, um, in part because of the um, um, extraordinary um, uh, easiness with which the food industry can process uh, soybean and, and corn into the production of processed foods, which therefore are, are are dumped on the markets at relatively low prices um, that make these foods attractive to the poorest segments of the population. Um, so this is um, uh, one uh, very clear um, um, socially um, uh, problematic impact of these um, uh, epidemics that are the result of shifting food systems. It is that it is the poorest segments of the population that are most severely affected. Um, 
amongst those, the women are especially affected. There's a very strong difference between the genders here. And nutritionists don't really manage to explain very convincingly why this is so, but the most usually um, 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 advanced explanation is that um, poor men uh, perform tasks that require large amounts of energy to be expended so that they consume the large amounts of energy that they eat um, uh, by their physical exercise, which is less the case uh, for, for women. In developing countries, it's a different part of the population that is most affected. Um, Non-communicable diseases that are linked to unhealthy diets primarily affect the emerging middle class and the highest uh, um, um, levels of income in those countries. And I, I, I would like to propose to summarize that in, in two graphs or two schemes, if you wish, that explain for rich countries and for poor countries successively how this functions. In developed countries, in rich countries, um, and beginning with the um, right-hand upper part of this uh, scheme, processed foods being cheaper, uh, they are more widely available to the low-budget households, and uh, these households um, therefore renounce uh, healthier options um, consisting in more fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, children born within these households born, live in what we call an a bisogenic environment um, with, pure, with poor um, nutritional habits and, and poor access to nutritional education. In many cases, these are children which in their adult lives will develop diseases as a result of uh, this um, unhealthy diet. And this has an impact on their ability to achieve as um, um, adults in um, um, the, the employment sector um, in many cases, it is a source of discrimination, of reduced work capacity, and um, therefore of increased uh, poverty uh, to be um, uh, overweight or obese. Uh, and so, as a result of this, um, this is a cycle that perpetuates uh, itself. Um, in developing countries, um, it is, as I said, uh, most commonly the case that middle class uh, uh, households um, have access to processed foods that is imported in these countries that are sold in, in supermarkets that are very rapidly expanding. And the result of this, uh, often underestimated and not noticed by nutritionists, but which is very important, is that local producers are gradually um, um, uh, crowded out from the local markets, simply because um, increasingly the demand for imported foods, processed foods sold in supermarkets is in rapid increase. As a result of this, the local food producers that could provide fresh, nutritious foods to the urban consumers uh, gradually lose any incentive to produce and to invest in their, in their farming. Um, uh, local farmers go out of business, local production declines, and the dependency of these uh, particularly low-income countries on trade on imports to feed themselves has been increasing over the past uh, 25, 30 years uh, very significantly. Uh, between 1992 and, and 2008, to give just one figure, the food bills of the 49 least developed countries increased on average um, uh, five or six fold. So these countries increasingly are dependent on importing uh, um, processed foods, um, but also um, um, wheat and, and rice um, in, in order to feed themselves, and the local producers have fewer chances to compete. And so these countries find themselves facing what is called a double burden. On the one hand, they have um, uh, children uh, um, and, and adults, uh, but especially children that are undernourished and, and are unable to feed themselves um, well. And then you have, at the same time, overweight and obesity that is that is developing in countries such as China, India, uh, uh, Brazil. Uh, this is uh, what I, I could see firsthand. So uh, based on these findings, I presented to the Human Rights Council in Geneva a set of recommendations. Um, they are too long to list here, but I, I would like to simply cite perhaps the six key messages uh, that I, I, I present as, as the conclusion of my report. And I have to say that the governments were extremely attentive to these messages, and the World Health Organization particularly was extremely encouraging 
um, and and uh, in the next few months, I, I I trust and I hope that the World Health Organization will continue to uh, pursue uh, these recommendations in implementing the um, findings of the summit held in New York in September 2011, which I already mentioned. A first recommendation is that uh, countries should implement much better the 1981 International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes and the recommendations adopted within the World, World Health Organization on the marketing of breast milk substitutes um, and of foods and non-alcoholic beverages to children. Um, today we have about 103 countries who have regulations in place that implement this international code on the marketing of breast milk substitutes, but in fact in only about 50 of these countries is there any enforcement mechanism um, um, in place. And in fact in only some 37 countries apparently are these enforcement mechanisms um, effective in, in discouraging companies from advertising substitutes to, to breast milk. Although we now know, and this is uh, a unanimous finding amongst nutritionists and public health specialists, that the best protection against um, uh, obesity and overweight in adult life is for children to be breastfed exclusively for six months and um, um, until their second birthday um, uh, with other um, um, components. A second recommendation is that we should regulate the marketing of foods to children that are, are high in saturated fats in, in sugars and salt and I believe also that we should restrict marketing uh, to these foods, uh, to other groups of these foods. Um, comparing simply the budgets that the food industry dedicates to advertising uh, with the budget available to governments uh, to promote healthy diets and good nutritional habits um, shows the total imbalance between, between the two uh, influences that the consumer uh, are subjected to. And I, I think it's, it's very important to, 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 to see marketing advertising as part of the problem. Most of this marketing goes actually to candies, to, um, to uh, snacks, to, to foods that are dense in energy but are of very poor nutritional content. And I, I think it's, it's, it's really one key part of the problem that the consumer is, 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 is promoting this as the ideal lifestyle. Thirdly, I think we should use the fiscal tool more. Um, I know this is a big debate in the United States. Um, it is also a debate in, in Mexico where I was in, in June to discuss these issues. Um, but the findings I could have access to show that taxing um, unnecessary foods such as soft drinks uh, or even snacks um, significantly reduces the consumption um, of these foods because the demand for these foods is highly elastic and sensitive to price uh, differences. Um, and we should, in my view, impose higher taxes on those unhealthy foods and use the money thus collected to subsidize access to fruits and vegetables and to subsidize educational campaigns on healthy diets. So the, the poor should be supported in having access to healthy diets. And although most um, um, people from the food industry I speak to uh, tell me that this is taxing the poor by taxing the food that they depend on. I believe we are not um, rendering a service to the poor by um, uh, subsidizing um, unhealthy diets that will lead them to develop uh, diseases in their adult lives. Um, fourth, I believe we should uh, take into account the impact of subsidies on uh, the food that is produced and the health uh, impacts of the food that is produced. Subsidies to a large extent have gone primarily to the production of um, major cereals, um, wheat, uh, corn, uh, rice, uh, and to, 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 to some extent to soybean, and it has basically been oblivious of the public health dimensions of those choices that were made in order to boost the availability of cheap calories for the benefit of um, the affordability of the food for the population. Um, the, the problem is that these subsidies today have become simply a way to subsidize the production of processed foods. And I know that, um, um, that um, David Wellinger shall discuss this in detail, so I won't say more, but I do think it's important to review agricultural subsidies 
uh, with these public health questions in mind. Fifth, we should, I believe, phase out entirely trans fatty acids and replace them with polyunsaturated fats. Nobody needs trans fatty acids and they are um, uh, problematic from the point of view of, of the health impacts. And finally, we should support farmers markets, we should support urban and peri-urban agriculture, we should support short food chains that link um, local producers to uh, uh, the consumers nearby so that these consumers have access to fresh nutritious foods and are less dependent on um, the, 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 the heavily processed uh, foods that are mostly sold in, in supermarket chains. So these are the main messages from the report, which of course I would recommend um, all the attendees of this, um, of this webinar to consult. Many thanks again for your attention. Thank you, Olivier. I think it's interesting to hear some of the parallels with debates we've started to have in this country. Um, I'll go on very quickly then to our next presenter, Dr. David Wallinga. Well, that was a, a great introduction and a, a review of things from a, a, right to few, a right to food and a sort of global perspective. And I'm going to try to echo some of those themes in our work, which dealt more with uh, North America and uh, also some work we've been doing for a while around more the domestic food environment in the U.S. And I want to just lay the context a little bit by uh, talking about sort of where I see things are at in terms of the public health uh, debate within the U.S. around uh, the obesity epidemic. We know that, for example, uh, and I think uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shooter talked about this, that consumption of diets high in added fats, sugars, refined grains, and of the processed foods and snacks and, and sodas that are derived from them, uh, in fact, promote obesity. And uh, here at IATP, we've looked at these, what it would have been called obesogenic food environments, and in a series of papers, we've kind of looked upstream at how farm food and trade policies, in fact, may uh, help to create those, those environments. Now, it's, it's not policy alone, but rather policy working in concert with some other broad economic and social forces. So we, we heard about globalization uh, and industrialization as another one the, that is the uh, uh, phenomena over time where our food and agriculture uh, entities have looked more and more like factories in, 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 in their focus on production using inputs with outputs rather than focusing on um, sort of creating sustainable uh, food producing environments. Now, what, what has been called an obesogenic environment is really two things. Um, uh, we're not going to deal with, with the dimension of discouraging physical activity. Uh, primarily, uh, there are environments that make it easier where the default is basically consumption of these calorie-dense, nutrient-poor foods that we've been talking about. Uh, so these would be foods that are somehow more accessible, uh, perhaps less costly in relative terms and, and more inflation resistant, which, which is what makes them sort of more attractive if you're on a limited income like the poor. Um, the, the trend in the paper that I'm going to talk about that we did, the trend that we were interested in looking at was uh, the fact that U.S. and Mexico are really the world leaders if, if, uh, in obesity. Um, they seem to have some kind of a comparative advantage in, in creating obesity. And uh, Mexico, though, though it's now in a close second to the U.S., uh, has followed it in, in a way that graphs out quite closely. So if you look in the left, uh, at just at Mexican and American women, you see that there's an increase in both uh, 
in the prevalence of obesity, uh, but, but with the Mexican trend line trailing that of the U.S. And then you see the same thing uh, in two time periods with uh, children, both in the U.S. and Mexico. And so uh, in this paper that we just published, uh, uh, exporting obesity, U.S. farm and trade policy, and the transformation of the Mexico consumer environment. We we looked at some of these obesity trends, and uh, and and asked a couple of questions of them in the context of uh, trade liberalization, uh, more specifically NAFTA. The NAFTA was a, a a trade agreement between the three countries of North America, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. The negotiations on it started around 1991, uh, didn't actually go into effect until 1994. Um, but, but what we observed, uh, and the question we wanted to ask in our research was, um, what connection might there be between rising obesity, both in the U.S. and Mexico, and the implementation of NAFTA in, in this time period? Did, in fact, NAFTA change the food environment uh, in Mexico? And uh, in effect, how, how closely was this tied to what we see with obesity? In, in other words, did, in some sense, uh, the imposition of this trade agreement somehow export the obesity trend from the U.S. to Mexico via NAFTA? Well, a couple things you, you should know about NAFTA. Um, one is that it was rather unique as compared to other uh, trade agreements preceding it in the degree to which it was an agreement between countries of very different uh, uh, development status. And um, that was interesting because the, the agreement was drafted in such a way that it presumed sort of an equality between the three countries uh, of economic development. It didn't really make any allowance for the fact that Mexico at the time uh, uh, was lesser developed uh, in many respects. Um, despite that, uh, there were separate bilateral agreements between the U.S. and Canada and the U.S. and Mexico, which uh, are quite different. So for example, uh, Canada and the U.S. negotiated continuing trade protections for trade in sugar, uh, dairy, and poultry, for example, while in the agreement between Mexico and the U.S., trade protections were lowered uh, uh, on beans and corn, which of course are a part of the um, uh, uh, part of the sort of traditional diet in Mexico, particularly white corn, and those were lowered over 14 years. And on the U.S. side, there were uh, lower barriers over time to asparagus, uh, sugar, and peanuts. Now, another uh, area in which NAFTA uh, um, was intriguing is that it, it uh, really dealt directly with foreign direct investment, or FDI. And in fact, it eased uh, restrictions on foreign ownership and investment, which if you think about the relative economic might of, of the U.S. and U.S. companies vis-a-vis -vis Mexico and Mexico companies is, uh, is quite interesting. And so at the same time that NAFTA was lowering these uh, direct investment uh, restrictions, Mexico on its side was abolishing domestic laws, uh, agriculture-specific domestic laws. So for example, preceding NAFTA, Mexico had a law that required the cattle be fed on grass rather than feed stuff like corn or soybeans. Mexico also had a tradition, an ajito tradition, which was a collective land holding tradition, and that was phased out uh, in favor of, or at least greatly reduced in favor of uh, new regulations that allowed foreigners, including uh, Americans and American companies, to own uh, uh, food producing land. So what we've seen, in fact, uh, and, and what we talked about in the paper is uh, how trade flows are observable uh, and, and changing post-NAFTA in this 14-year time period. And just to, in very broad brush terms, what we see is 
the importation into Mexico of commodity uh, grains and oil seeds uh, like corn and soybean along with meat products and on the other side uh, the increased exportation of fresh fruits and vegetables to the US. In the next several slides I'm going to put a finer point on some of these and break them down a little bit. So meat products. Um, if you look across a variety of meat products from beef to pork to poultry, for example, you see quite a remarkable increase in, in exports from the U.S. to Mexico uh, from 1991 to 93 time period to the 2002-2009 time period. So for example, beef exports into Mexico uh, went up about 234%, pork exports 87%, chicken exports, chicken products, 307%. Uh, and actually, if you look within categories like chicken, uh, at, uh, at particular kind of products like um, the kind of chicken protein used in uh, chicken nuggets, for example, or uh, um, used in fast food chicken uh, drumsticks, the, the increases were, were even larger. <clears throat> now, um, as many know, uh, in the U.S. model, currently most uh, livestock and poultry are raised on diets of corn and soy and other feedstuffs. Uh, prior to NAFTA, that was not the case in Mexico. So it's maybe not surprising that since NAFTA, there's been an export from the U.S. to Mexico uh, of feedstuffs that's increased about 150%. Now, simultaneously, there's been an increase in Mexican meat production in poultry and, and pork. Uh, that's in the green line, and it tracks quite closely with the red line. So it seems pretty clear that a lot of the imported uh, corn, and, uh, yellow corn, and other feed grains are going into Mexican meat production. Uh, and here, here to look a little more closely at corn, this is yellow corn, not the traditional white corn, which of course is native to Mexico and, and which uh, traditionally was used in uh, uh, corn tortillas and eaten as a whole uh, edible food, but rather yellow uh, uh, feed corn, the kind which is made into starches uh, uh, or corn syrup, for use in processed food products, but not cannot really be eaten by people directly. And that those corn imports from the U.S. nearly quadrupled compared to average levels uh, pre-NAFTA. And and as I said, much of this was uh, has been used by Mexican meat producers. Uh, uh, both owned by U.S. and Mexican companies, and they've benefited quite a bit from the fact that the price at which the, this yellow corn and other, other commodities have been exported to Mexico often is less than the cost that it takes to produce those uh, uh, products. So for example, the corn imports into Mexico are priced about 10% cheaper than what it costs to produce that corn. Similarly for soybeans, wheat, cotton, and rice. And IATP in a previous study actually looked at that issue. Now if you look at um, high fructose corn syrup, which is obviously made from this yellow corn, uh, it's an interesting case because uh, um, what happened was at, even after NAFTA, Mexico had in place a law which uh, prohibited uh, use of uh, corn syrup instead of sugar as a sweetener and things like soda pop. And as a result, the importation of high fructose corn syrup and, and many uh, sweetener products remained quite low. Uh, what, uh, that went into a NAFTA dispute, which was ultimately resolved in 2006. And almost immediately, you saw this enormous increase uh, in uh, uh, Mexican importation of high fructose corn syrup and related products. And um, not coincidentally, many of the processed food products which have things like 
hydrolyzed vegetable oil from soybeans or uh, high fructose corn syrup as major ingredients have also gone up since NAFTA it was implemented in 1984. Um, the biggest jump uh, has been in uh, processed produce and dairy products, but close behind are snack foods uh, and, and these other categories in here. And in fact, uh, of the imported snack foods, just as one example, about 98% ultimately come from the, the U.S. Uh, similarly, uh, we have seen some increases in foreign direct investment, which I mentioned before. Uh, uh, these inquiries increased quite uh, markedly after NAFTA. Um, uh, and you see here both in food and related products, but then if you focus on food only, again, uh, uh, increase in billions of dollars. And this uh, is really all along what's called the food supply chain. So all the way from food uh, production, meat production, to food processing, distribution, and even at the retail level. 75% of the U.S. foreign direct investment has been in firms making processed foods like snack foods and, and uh, processed meat foods and, and uh, bakery and other confectionery products. So in summary then, um, what the study we did has laid out is this increase in U.S. exports of corn, of soy, sugar, meat products, and snack foods into Mexico since NAFTA. Uh, as I said, all along the supply chain, which, which are these blue boxes in both countries, and simultaneously uh, increase in U.S. investment along the uh, food supply chain. And I mentioned the retail side and just give an example that uh, in the retail food sector, for example, in Mexico, by 2005, one in five pesos was controlled by just one company. Increasingly, then, the Mexican food system looks uh, much like the industrialized U.S. food system. In fact, uh, it's now a U.S.-Mexican food system where many of the players are identical. And the changes in investment and trade correlate pretty, uh, uh, pretty well with changes in what Mexicans eat, followed by rapid increases in overweight and obesity. And NAFTA, uh, we concluded, has contributed to sort of this obesogenic food environment now in Mexico where soft drinks, refined uh, and processed dairy products and foods and meat uh, are more available and where there's increased investment by U.S.-based companies in the companies uh, that make uh, or, or import those for sale into Mexico. I'm just going to give you a couple of statistics about changing Mexican consumption. Uh, snack food consumption went up 60% just in three years, uh, kind of five to seven years after NAFTA. And, uh, among women, which Dr. DeShooter talked about, uh, high energy beverage consumption uh, tripled just in a seven year time period. And, uh, that's research by Barry Popkin and others. So our recommendations to wrap up are that national trade policy debates really need to include a discussion up front of how to ensure that uh, new trade regimes can promote public health and nutrition goals and not just focus on uh, 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 export uh, or trade in, in products. Trade policymakers, though they don't do this now, ought to be seeking the expertise and involvement of the public health community. Uh, for example, and we heard this before, um, uh, one idea is that uh, it could be required of, of uh, new multilateral or bilateral trade agreements that they undergo some kind of health impact assessment or HIA. And this is one structured way of thinking about potential uh, or foreseeable health impacts like the ones I've been talking about. And finally, to the extent that U.S. Uh, has both trade policy as well as food security policy, one shouldn't undercut the other unintentionally. So for example, uh, this administration's got a national export initiative with a goal of doubling uh, 
U.S. exports over the next five years, a major portion of which are agriculture exports. But this goal shouldn't be pursued, in our opinion, at the expense of uh, goals within the administration's Feed the Future uh, program, goals around uh, addressing global hunger and food insecurity. So with that, I want to just acknowledge the other authors of this, some of them from IATP. Sarah Clark uh, the, uh, deserves special kudos. She was actually the leader author on the study and was a student at Tufts in their master's program and just did a phenomenal job in, in pulling this research together. So thank you, and I, I look forward to your questions. Thanks, David. I think we'll go right into the questions now, and I have several uh, queued up that have come in. Uh, we'll start with one from Jeff Meir. He asks, is Dr. DeShooter aware of that the same issues with respect to replacement of traditional foods and increases in non-communicable diseases are also taking place among some Native American populations in the United States. Um, he gives us an example, the Tohono O'odham people, sorry about that, uh, in Arizona who are experiencing increasing adult obesity and with more than 50% of the adult population with type 2 diabetes. Um, the tribal leadership believes this is largely because of tr that traditional food gathered from plants and animals in the desert southwest has given way to processed foods high in sugar, salt, and fat. Olivier, would you like to, to say something about that? Well, um, I shall be looking at this issue in, in some detail in Canada for the First Nations there. Uh, where I know the, the, the same problem is occurring and um, I'm very privileged that the Canadian government has provided me with the opportunity to do a mission uh, in Canada to study this. Unfortunately, my, my request to, to do the same in the U.S. has not been answered yet, but I am hopeful that I shall be able to, to travel to the U.S. On, in my official capacity to, to explore this in greater depth. Um, but thank you for this uh, reminder and, of course, it is uh, uh, clearly uh, um, uh, the, the case that uh, native populations are um, very severely um, uh, struck by this nutrition transition, absolutely. We have several questions about the issue of a soda tax um, from Nishi Singai. Um, well, anyway, several, several people have written about that. Um, one asking if Dr. DeShooter agrees that sugar-sweetened beverages in general should be taxed. Another questioning, um, if, if this were to be taxed, how, how can we do this when countries such as Mexico, and I would say the United States, uh, have industries that actively lobby against it? Um, I think David may have something to say about this issue, too, of the, the soda tax. Well, I, I actually think, you know, there's a lot of ways to address uh, um, issues around this prevalence of sweetened foods. Uh, I think taxes is only one potential policy mechanism. I know we talked about the marketing uh, of, uh, uh, there's labeling issues in the U.S. Um, there's a lot of hidden sweeteners under different names. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, the, the, there's very little um, up-to-date information just educating people about really how harmful uh, sweetened beverages are. And, and partly it's because the science is evolving quite rapidly around fructose and, and other sweetened foods and the degree to which they contribute to insulin resistance, diabetes, and, and other chronic diseases. So I think um, it, it, to answer one of the questions, it is quite a hurdle that, that obviously the marketing and lobbying budgets of some of the global companies are, are quite large and really dwarf the budgets of the U.S. government itself uh, to promote healthier foods. So that's, that's just a fact. Um, it's not clear how, how one can get beyond that. Another person in the audience asked if there would be any trade issues uh, involved in NAFTA if such a change were to happen. And it is entirely possible that if there were such a change, uh, there could be an investor state dispute where a company could challenge that this was, would unfairly undermine their investments. 
uh, or perhaps even a state-to-state -state dispute has happened with the high fructose corn syrup, which is not to say it shouldn't happen, but I think it just points out some of the, the real limitations in our trade policy. Um, I think uh, we have another question from Rosemary Hill, just is slightly different. Uh, she asks, uh, can you comment on the nutritional impact of food aid funneled through these channels of globalized agricultural trade beyond the fact that food aid is immediate calories for individuals in zones experiencing famine, like Niger and the wider Sahel? What are the longer term nutritional health, economic, and development effects of such large scale cereal food aid? Well, I suppose this is a question for, for me. Um, um, I, I have to say food aid in the past has sometimes had um, quite uh, detrimental impacts, particularly by discouraging local producers um, and the, because of bad timing of food aid and, and inadequate targeting, uh, representing a disincentive for these producers to, to uh, uh, increase their productivity and and uh, respond to the needs of the local population. The, the uh, nutrition impacts um, in, indeed have never been part of uh, um, the, the priorities of the, the donors. And uh, um, I, I published a report on food aid uh, three years ago, which, which highlighted this uh, as, as one potential issue that deserved uh, uh, greater attention. Um, I, I can't be more specific because really one would need to distinguish from region to region how food aid has developed and how it has changed the habits of the local population, but it cannot be excluded that sometimes it has had long-term impacts, um, particularly by discouraging people from um, uh, remaining on, on traditional diets that sometimes are more nutritious than, than what uh, they were given. Um, in terms of food aid packages. All right, thank you. I have a question here um, for David, who says, so if this is the case, why is the WHO, the World Health Organization, resisting the idea that one of the new NCD global targets should be to reduce marketing of high fat, high sugar, trans fat containing products to children? I don't, this may actually be a question for Olivier as well. Yeah, I don't think, I don't, I don't know enough about the WHO recommendations to speak to that. But Olivier? No, well, I suppose what I can say is that I, I worked very closely with the World Health Organization and it's, a, it's an organization where different views are expressed and uh, where the consensus views are not always uh, the most um, uh, progressive ones. Um, the World Health Organization is, is basically an, an organization that um, presents recommendations that it hopes shall have some um, uh, political backing from governments and ultimately uh, um, my report is also meant to encourage the World Health Organization to go further in, in its uh, approach to, to the, the, uh, the problems that it denounces by uh, being bold enough as I think the situation requires. In, in developing uh, what it now has to develop, which is a follow-up to the New York summit, uh, the high-level meeting on non-communicable diseases of September 2011. During the next uh, uh, eight weeks or so, the World Health Organization shall be working uh, further to, to, to this end with um, a World Health Assembly that is planned to take place in May where these recommendations shall be presented and we shall see uh, uh, whether the World Health Organization shall, shall go far enough in, in following in particular that, that recommendation on advertising um, um, HFSS foods. All right, um, so I also have a question that's directed to Dr. DeShooter but I believe David may have something to say about it as well. It's a and I'm sorry, I don't know these ac some of these acronyms. Why recommend replacing trans fats with PUFAs? Doesn't recent research suggest that PUFAs are less health promoting than monounsaturated and even saturated fats, the latter of which are more shelf life, life stable and less prone to oxidation? So David, could you well, perhaps... Yeah. 
Yeah, go ahead. PUFAs are polyunsaturated fatty acids, of which there are two major kinds, the omega-3s, uh, which are common in fish oil and flaxseed and, and, and uh, other sources, and omega-6s, uh, which are um, uh, 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 more prevalent in a lot of oils like soybean oil, for example, or corn oil. And, you know, I just came from a nutrition conference where we talked quite a bit about oils. I don't think, you know, there's a lot of literature, a huge literature now about different kinds of fats. And I think the, the easiest way to summarize it is that, uh, is that we probably did ourselves a disservice by discouraging uh, healthy fat consumption. It, it, we're still teasing out what the right mix of healthy fats are, but it's certainly true that by having diets so high in carbohydrates and uh, 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 as opposed to proteins and fats that, we, that that's contributed to some of the diet-related disease that we have now. Now, the one exception to that is that nobody disagrees that trans fats are really quite bad for you. And, uh, um, and that the, the, for example, in the U.S., the ban on trans fats has been uh, really seen as quite a good thing and a very effective step. Um, we've had several questions about the issue of the expansion of fast food uh, restaurants in Mexico and other developing countries and what can be done about that. I think that the study found that that was one of the contributing factors. Uh, to the changing food environment in Mexico. And uh, so one question is, how does a developing country avoid bringing in those companies uh, when it would bring in a lot of investment? I, I think just to start on that, it, you know, getting back again to the investment question, one of the, the big challenges is that NAFTA model, which is being extended now in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would involve many other countries, really prohibits uh, any kind of restrictions or conditions on foreign investment and it allows for challenges, legal challenges, when those are implemented. Uh, one thing we're, we're very concerned about now with the, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, is that it may also introduce uh, conditions on procurement rules so that programs like farm-to-school programs in different countries uh, could be subject to disputes as well. Um, but I don't know if either of you also have something to say about this issue of the expansion of fast food restaurants and, uh, and, and the trade agreement. Well, I would like to make one general comment on the um, restrictions that countries face uh, as a result of investment or trade treaties or investment provisions in trade treaties. Um, I think we now are witnessing a, a situation in which increasingly the bodies um, in charge of um, settling investment disputes are aware that investment law cannot be dissociated from uh, more broad uh, um, uh, public uh, objectives. And um, increasingly there is a realization that uh, the rights of investors should be subordinated to public welfare objectives when those are um, uh, genuinely pursued by, by states. I think um, that that will be true also in the area of public procurement. Um, if, for example, a country decided that uh, um, uh, the school feeding programs should be sourcing from local producers um, that could provide fresh nutritious foods instead of uh, uh, by, by um, uh, uh, companies that, that do not present the same advantages in terms of uh, uh, either quality of foods or, or even um, rural development and benefits for the um, uh, local farmers. Um, and I think what's important is that these rules be gradually clarified because in many cases it is a chilling effect that discourages governments from adopting bold policies that could pass muster under these treaties. Uh, were these policies to be actually um, uh, implemented. Um, and I, I, I simply would, would like to um, um, highlight the danger that uh, we would, that, that, that would consist in um, reading too restrictively the, the, 
the provisions that, that leave to states a certain a margin of appreciation in which policies they can implement. So for this reason, those clauses should be clarified and they should be, um, uh, there should be a possibility to seek an authoritative interpretation based on any policy that states intend to implement um, before they, they actually um, have to run the risk of being condemned uh, for going too far in, in a certain direction. You know, let me add one thing, Karen, and that's that, um, you know, one of the challenges is that uh, countries don't always exchange information about the rules to which these transnational corporations, uh, convenience food companies are subjected to. So, for example, um, it doesn't make any sense from a policy standpoint that McDonald's serves meat raised without antibiotics in Europe. Uh, but the same, and they have the same suppliers of that meat in the U.S., but in the U.S., they are allowed to, um, th they have a different set of standards in the U.S. Or, for example, that, um, you know, M&Ms produced for the United Kingdom uh, have certain food, uh, uh, or, sorry, let me back up. M&Ms produced in the U.S. have certain food dyes which, uh, uh, the, the manufacturer has voluntarily taken out of their M&Ms for the UK market because of concerns that they trigger problems with um, uh, learning disabilities and inattention. So th there are these health-related problems uh, associated with, with how foods are processed and, and, and made, uh, but the different set of standards are being used by the same company in different countries. So it seems to me that, that the governments, the regulating governments, ought to be exchanging a lot more information and subjecting some of the companies to the same standards. Menu lab labeling is another one. Uh, trans fat bans is another one. OK. Um, I am sorry there are many excellent questions we don't have time to address, and we're actually over time. I'd like to. And though, uh, with one general question, uh, which came from Alicia Sandberg, uh, as a public health professional, what role can I play in impacting these policies, both public health and trade? And I think that's, that's a good note to close on. What can people do about this? Uh, and then we'll wrap up the webinar. Well, I, I know. Uh, you know, I'm very active in the American Public Health Association. It's got a small but growing group that's looking at globalization issues uh, in public health. Uh, but there are opportunities there. These are not issues that typically get focused on uh, within schools of public health, uh, um, uh, within professional societies. Um, but, but. Clearly, there's a lot of ripe areas, very interesting areas, both for research and for advocacy around this nexus between globalization and health. Well, I, I would, I think, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to Alicia for this uh, final question. I think it's extremely important that pressure builds upon uh, governments uh, um, so that they take seriously the challenges they are confronting. Uh, to a large extent, these policies we have been commenting upon, David Wallinga and myself, have been highly part dependent. They've been reactions to food price crisis. They've been reactions to the efforts of lobbyists uh, in the past uh, 30 years. Uh, and we've never actually updated those policies based on the new findings from the public health community. Public health professionals, I believe, should form alliances with farmers' organizations. They should form alliances with food policy councils that are developing very rapidly in the US, in Canada, and elsewhere, uh, in which citizens try to regain control over the food systems and understand which dependencies they are uh, subjected to. And I believe that by uh, forging these alliances, we can really uh, make, a, make a difference. Uh, to, to many people in the broad public, the links between agriculture, food, and health are not very obvious and they, the information they receive is fragmentary and sometimes contradictory. So public health professionals really have a responsibility in, in changing this state of things. I, I, I would add briefly, Karen, if I could. Okay. 
that we, we do have something called the Charter uh, for a Healthy Farm Bill, which is, lays out a series of health-based principles that for the kind of food system that a farm bill in the U.S. And, and I suppose elsewhere too could support. So that's something very concrete. You can get information for that on our website. Okay. Well, thanks to both of you, and especially uh, Dr. DeShooter. I understand it's late at night now in Europe. Uh, thanks very much for this webinar. And to people listening, please do look at our website, uh, www.iatp.org, uh, where we'll have information about future webinars and where we will post this recording within two weeks. Thanks to everyone for joining us.